All right, awesome. It looks like we are live. Um, I want to say good morning to everybody. We're going to give a few seconds for those who want to uh, join us on our um, Facebook and YouTube pages. We are here this morning with two of our awesome chamber members to share some really important information about advanced planning when it comes to estate planning, will preparation, um, and funeral expenses. A lot of things that we tend to put in the back of our mind that are things that we should be thinking about now and preparing for, especially to not burden our, our loved ones and our families. Um, getting us as prepared as possible for these types of situations is really important and we want to bring you with the experts here that we have in the room to talk to you about this and help you with that planning. And I see we have quite a few who have joined us on live. Thank you all so much for those of you who are joining us. We're going to give another few seconds for a few more people to join in. Uh, before we do that, uh, I just want to mention that we also have a Zoom call available. So if you are interested in joining us on the Zoom call, you're welcome to do that. We'll be taking your questions. So if you have any questions for those of you who are on the call, uh, we'll be happy to take those and you can type those into the comment box uh, or we'll unmute your mic at the end of each presenter's um, presentation. So again, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to, to take those from you. Those of you who are joining us live, if you have any questions in regards to this advanced planning workshop, please type those in the comment box and we'll be reading those out to our presenters and doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I first want to start before we jump into the presentations. I'd like for our presenters to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with Ms. Cynthia Benavides with Benavides Law Firm. Cynthia, I'm going to pass it to you to do a, a quick little intro there before we get started. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much, Barbara, for having me here today. Um, my name is Cynthia Benavides, and I'm an attorney. I practice here in West Texas, Texas and service actually all of Hidalgo County and Cameron County. I will take court hearings in either location. I've been practicing in uh, transactional law, which is includes estate planning, probate, guardianship, a little bit of family law, uh, definitely a lot of real estate and business law for about 14 years. I spent my first 10 years uh, with a large firm at Jones Gallagher and Lozano, still very close with them, and, and, uh, and then went out on my own about four years ago to start my own practice. I also have a title company here in Westville which I associate with Edwards Abstract, and we basically brought Edwards Abstract back to the Mid-Valley after about a 10-year um, absence. So any uh, real estate, title, closing, anything you need, we can help you here. And, um, and of course, any estate planning and probate, I'm happy to sit with you and consult. Wonderful. Thank you, Cynthia. And we also have the McCaleb's with us, Mark McCaleb and Carla McCaleb. I'm going to pass it over to you all to do a little intro there. Morning, Mark and Carla McCaleb, uh, third generation funeral directors. Uh, I'm a third generation. She's a first generation. Um, I've served the community since 1963 with my grandfather and my father, and I've, we have since taken over. And uh, we're here to serve the community and help out people in dire need. That. Awesome. Thank you all so much again for uh, taking time to be with us this morning and answer any questions. I want to remind those who are joining us live um, through Facebook and YouTube, if you have any questions, type those in the comment box. Again, we find it really important to bring in the experts in the room and, uh, and hear from them about these really important steps that come in our lives that we want to prepare our families for. And uh, we thank you both uh, for taking time to be with us this morning and, and share your expertise. So thank you again. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to start with uh, Ms. Benavides, and we're going to talk about the will preparation estate planning. So I'm going to go ahead and put that presentation up on the screen here for everyone to see, and um, we'll go ahead and get started. And Ms. Benavides, just let me know as you need us to advance the slides, um, and we'll get that done for you. Thank you so much, Barbara. So I, you know, I'm... I'm I'm a lawyer. I'm not a I'm not a tech savvy person, and unfortunately, lawyers have this uh, appearance of being a little bit boring. And so I apologize in advance for the boring look of my of my <laughs> of my PowerPoint here. But I entitled it Estate Planning 101 because I was asked to speak about will, and and that's the question I get a lot from a lot of clients that walk into my office. I need a will, or they'll ask, you know, do I prepare will? And, you know, my response to that is always, well, you may not need a will. So let's talk about what you do need. 
And that is what is, that's what we call estate planning. We look at what you have, we look at your assets, we look at your long-term plans, whether you're going to want to Medicaid plan or not, and we create what's called an estate plan. Can we get to the next slide, slide please? And so I'm going to tell you what estate plan can encompass. It, it can encompass a will, of course, that so we have in, a, in the PowerPoint listed. It can include a will, but it might not include a will. It might instead include what we call an enhanced life estate plan which some people might think of as a living will. And that is actually, there's different types, but the two main types that we see here in Texas are what we call a ladybird deed and a transfer on debt. Um, an estate plan may or may not include a trust. We very, I, I very rarely recommend trust to people unless uh, they really do require it with regard to having a special needs child or wanting to Medicaid plan or if they really have larger estates or multiple, you know, marriages in their, in their background that they need to create these revocable or irrevocable trusts. An estate plan may even include a formation of entities, whether it's a family limited partnership or an LLC. Of course, part of my estate plans, which I strongly recommend for everybody, are powers of attorney. And if you get nothing done during this pandemic, if you can get yourself some powers of attorney, that's going to help you and your family members to avoid more costly legal uh, proceedings such as guardianship, which can run upwards from, you know, 2000 to 3000 to more dollars. But if you have a power of attorney, that's a couple hundred of hundreds of dollars and it can save you a lot of time and expense. So we, we usually throw in a medical power of attorney and a statutory durable power of attorney in your state plan. Uh, the other thing that an estate plan can include is a declaration of guardian, either for yourself or for your children. Of course, we also talk, I also talked to you about pay on death accounts and how we can avoid probate proceedings through the use of pay on death accounts and help you kind of jog your memory of what you have in your asset list and what you, who you need to check in with, whether it's your bank or your financial advisor. Of course, if you're coming to me post death of a loved one, there's still some work we can do to avoid probate, and that might include something called an affidavit fairship. So all of these things can, are, are tools in, in any inter, good attorney's arsenal that they can use to help you either plan properly or recover from not planning. And so a good estate planning attorney will help you uh, go through this, this arsenal and figure out what's best for you. Can we get to the next slide? So... A lot of people might ask, well, why do I need an attorney? I'm super smart. I can Google. I can figure all this out all on my own. There's, you know, all of these um, advertisements and about making a will online and doing my own powers of attorney online. Why do I need you, Cindy? Well, why do you need an attorney? The reason you need an attorney is because everything's bigger and better in Texas. And Texas is a very death-friendly state, which means you may not need a will. So if you go online spend two or three hundred dollars getting a will done and wasting your time figuring out the system. Number one, a lot of these wills that I see online, they may not um, they may not be executed correctly. So you may have a good will, but you didn't execute it correctly, meaning you didn't sign it correctly with witnesses and a notary. The second problem I see with a lot of these online wills is you may not even need one. And I have a lot of elderly um, people that come to me, they have their, their, they've passed away, their children come to me, and they say, I've got this will. And I tell, I ask them, well, did they have Medicaid? But yes, they did. Well, if they had Medicaid and we open a court proceeding for this will, then we're going to kind of initiate for the state of Texas what we call the Medicaid Estate Recovery Act. So we don't want to go the will route. And when you have Medicaid, you want to think ahead and actually not prepare a will or talk to an attorney so we can help you decide for whether whether the will is the best route because there, there are ways to get around things such as the Med Medicaid and state recovery program. So the other reason you need an attorney is a lot of people come to me and they say, I heard I need a trust. Everybody tells me I need a trust because I've got to avoid all of the costly probate that goes on in, in the state of Texas. And I explain to them that that is not true. The state of Texas is a death-friendly state. There are ways to avoid probate, such as enhanced deeds, ladybird deeds, transfer on death deeds, affidavits of airship. The state of Texas actually creates 
a will for you. And there are ways to avoid probate. And I walk you through all of that when you come to me. If you happen to be a will candidate, the probate in Texas is pretty streamlined, is pretty quick. It, during the pandemic, we have seen a slowdown in the the timeline of when a, when a will is taken to court and how quickly it gets uh, approved. But for the most part, it takes 30 days to 45 days to probate a will and take it to court. And that's another thing a lot of people don't understand is that a will is not the end all. The will is step one. Step two, you actually post death have to take that will to court. And that can be a costly process, but not as costly as other states such as California, who are the ones that started with this whole everybody needs a trust deal. Because in California, the probate process is complicated, expensive, and unique. Texas is not that way. Um, so a good attorney can help you consider what's the best package for you. They can also help you consider all the pitfalls such as probate assets versus non-probate assets, which I'll talk about in a little bit, the easiest and cheapest options for you in the long run, pre-death and post-death. We can help you consider things such as kids outside of your current marriage, um, whether you're separated but not divorced, or whether you want to disinherit somebody. We can also help you consider complex things such as family members who have special needs and are receiving benefits from the government. If you give them certain amounts of inheritance that may disqualify them from those uh, benefits in the long run. So we help you make those considerations. It will not always disinherit them, but it might depending on what you're passing to them. We also help you consider long-term planning, such as Medicaid planning, if that's something that you think might qualify for in the future. Um, of course, for the extremely wealthy, we do help you consider things such as state taxes. And for, that's really for the extremely wealthy. That's people who have over 10 million and people who are not U.S. So we can get to the next one. So I just mentioned probate versus non-probate assets. This is part of my consultation. I help you understand what a probate asset is versus what a non-probate asset is. Just because um, you die with a will does not mean the transfer to your properties to transfer automatically. We actually have to go to court to get the will deemed valid by a judge, by a sitting judge in either Hidalgo or County County, depending on where you die and what your assets are at. So that is what probate is, is the process of taking the will to court. What a probate asset is are the actual assets which were transferred by the will. So an example of a probate asset would be uh, usually real estate or a bank account that has no pay on death beneficiary, a life insurance policy, which failed to name a living beneficiary or a stock interest in LLC or entities. Um, those, those type of interests are typically passed by, by and through a will. Uh, certain real estate and personal property is usually also passed through a will, but we, if we can, we can help you. I can help you decipher what's best for you. Um, Non-probate assets would be those assets that transfer automatically. So assets that are pay on death by statute, uh, such as vehicles can pass by statute, meaning by what the Texas laws have set forth. Um, Texas law actually creates a will for you. It's called intestate succession, and that can be used to even pass real estate or motor vehicles. So. I can help you figure out whether or not you really need a will or whether we can just utilize what Texas are created for your, for your succession and for your heirs. So an exa another example of non-probate assets is things like bank accounts for the most part. Those are pay on death. Or if you have a joint, it automatically goes to your surviving joint account holder. Uh, if you if you are, have a single account, then Usually when you signed up for your bank account, you list it who your beneficiaries are. So we think about those things in the consultation. We make a list and, and you figure out who you need to touch base with and whether you need to update your beneficiaries. We also, also uh, non-probate assets would also include retirement accounts if they're pay on death, life insurance policies if they're pay on death. Um, and you want to make sure you have a current pay on death beneficiary, not somebody who's already passed away. And you need to revisit that usually about half of what I suggest. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. 
Texas and Texas succession is not perfect. I know that uh, what that means is basically in Texas, Texas creates a will for you. Okay. So in, in other words, if, if you're married, you've only been mar in that marriage for your entire life and you only have kids of that marriage, Texas says your spouse gets everything when you die. Now there's except there are definitely exceptions to this rule when it comes to things like separate property versus what we call community property. So, you know, that Texas and Texas succession is complicated and it, you should be sitting with an attorney to better understand it and to better understand whether you want to go the intestate succession route, which is I'm just going to die without a will, basically, because Texas created one for me. Uh, you know, that doesn't always work for everybody. And if you're divorced with kids and you want all your property to go to your children in equal shares, then, you you know, it, it, it might work well for you. But if you're in your second marriage and you've got your house separate property, there's a lot of complex things that go into whether or not you want to die without a will and just leave it up to the state of Texas to decide who your heirs are. So um, I'm not going to go too much in depth into this, uh, this slide because I think it gets a little bit too complex and you really need to sit down with an attorney to truly determine whether you want to go the no will route. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So you're probably wondering what it's all going to cost. Well, um, individual will or enhanced these packages, I usually charge 500 for an individual. It's really not that expensive. You get a full hour consultation with me, um, plus the will execution. We make sure that you can sign it properly and provide the witnesses for you. It could include a will, a power of a medical power of attorney, and a general power of attorney, or it'll include a will uh, or a lady bird deed. So a lady bird deed is an enhanced estate deed, and I basically sit with you and help you determine what the best path is going to be for you. For a husband and wife estate plan, which is simple, um, those packages start at $900, and for what I consider a simple estate pa package will include two wills or one transfer on death deed, uh, two medical powers of attorney, and two general powers of attorney. Uh, complex estate plans are billed at an hourly rate of 250 an hour, and entity formations for LLC and corporations are billed at about approximately $800. So, um, if you're wondering what it costs, I'm not going to hide the ball from you. This is, these are the rates that I charge, and they're, they're very economical rates. And I know you're thinking, well, I saw online it's only two or $300. But again, you're, you're going to be giving yourself something that you might not need. And that's why you, I strongly recommend that you meet either with me as your attorney or find a good estate planning attorney in your, in your county. Okay. Um, can we get to the next one? Right. So these are my areas of practice. If you're curious, I practice in real estate through my law firm and, of course, have Edwards Abstract here. Um, I practice in estate planning. I take probate matters, including guardianship, declaration of heirships, and probate matters. I practice in business law, family law, and, of course, like every good attorney in the state of Texas and elsewhere, car accident. So those are my areas of practice. Do you have any questions? Can we get to the next slide? My contact information are, is going to be included on my slides, and I've got a Facebook page and a Google page. You're welcome to check those out and check out the reviews. Um, and if you need any assistance, I'm happy to, happy to help out. And that's the end of my presentation for now. I'll take questions and answers whenever Barbara says it's time. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That was great information. Uh, I want to say thank you again to those who have joined us on the uh, social media pages. I see that we have quite a few viewers on our Facebook page. For those of you on social, we've put up on your screen the contact information and location of um, Cynthia Benavides' law firm, and we hope that you uh, contact her um, certainly to, to prepare as you look into this process. All right. So we're going to uh, move into our next presentation. If you have any questions, we're going to take uh, the questions at the end of the second presentation, um, and then we'll we'll address those as we go. So please, if you have any questions, um, type those into the comment box. We'll be reading those out to our experts in the room and uh, doing a Q&A at the end of the session. So please make sure to type in your questions in the comment section, and we'll make sure to address those. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next presentation, 
with Michaela Funeral Home, who will talk to us about funeral expenses and planning. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Carla and Mark. Hi there. Um, so we just have um, a few slides to go through and, and probably take um, a lot of uh, questions and answers at the end or however many you have. Um, but basically, um, we um, just want to talk to you about the advantages of pre-planning um, your, your funeral arrangements. Um, so, you know, you can pre-plan with obviously any uh, funeral home. Um, our funeral home, um, a lot of y'all familiar with the Michaela funeral home. Um, so you want to plan with the funeral home that you trust, um, just, you know, that your family can depend on and that, that it's going to be there um, at the time, which, you know, hopefully is many years down the road, but you want someone that your family will know um, they can still go to. Um, so, um, you know, how does funeral planning impact me? Um, most, there there was a pretty good statistic when I first started um, doing prearranged funerals and I come from a different background, but I thought it was interesting. They re, they go out and they um, survey people that have prearranged their funeral and 100% of them, everyone they survey is glad that they did it. They don't say, I wish I wouldn't have done it. Um, they're happy with their decision. Um, so whether you, there's two ways to, to pre-plan. You can either pre-plan and prepay. Um, so, you know, basically, or you can pre-plan and just plan because you may have um, a pay on death account or you may have life insurance that is designed to pay, pay for your funeral and that's fine. But Basically, if an unexpected death occurs tomorrow, who's going to be in charge of your plans? It's like a guy told me just a couple of days ago. He says, Carla, did my dad pick his casket? You know, whether he paid for it or picked it really didn't matter to him because he said, I don't want to have to go in that room and pick a casket. And so the emotional impact um, of that was important. Um, and then, of course, you know, who will pay for the funeral bill? You, you know, are you going to have it paid through life insurance? Um, or are you going to have it um, already paid? Um, a lot of people don't realize how much um, a funeral costs, you know. So the, the nice thing about prepaying for a funeral is that we have um, plans that will freeze the cost. So if you, what you pay for today's funeral will be guaranteed for 30, 40 years down the road. And, or yeah, however long you, you know, however long you live and it doesn't go up with inflation. So that's a nice thing. Um, so today millions of people recognize the financial and, the net, financial and emotional advantages of funeral planning. So obviously it relieves the emotional burden. Um, secondly, it allows you to plan what you want because it is, I, I hate to see it and it doesn't happen often, but if there's a tragedy or, you know, there's an emotional expense, people want to, maybe they want to spend more money than, than their mom would have spent because it's just, they're, they're trying to, to do something now, but mom would have been happy in a very simple, you know, 20 gauge casket and you want to go out and buy a bronze, you know? So there is that emotional spending, and so you you get to pick what you want, and, and they don't they're not they don't get to change it. Um, and of course, it also protects financial burdens, and that's always a factor. You know, you got three kids, and and you know one's going to end up paying the bill, or you know it, it's never it's rarely, and we see it, but it's rare that you take that funeral bill and split it three ways, and everybody pitches in. Usually, it's some tension. And so that's, that's no fun, you know, at a, at a time, at a time when you're going through a lot of emotional stress to have to worry about the financial impact on top of it. So, um, you know, the, some people, some people worry about the finance, some people worry about the emotional. It, it's not, 
everyone's different, but you want to learn about each one and how it would benefit your loved ones the most because um, it should be a time for grieving and celebrating lives and not a time for, which unfortunately, especially when pre-planning is not in play, sometimes turns into a time of um, fighting and, and just, you know, it, 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 you've seen everything. I could write a long book about it, but uh, it's much easier whenever mom's got everything listed out and there's no, um, there's less choices. So these are just some, some components that we feel that are part of a, a meaningful service. Um, we do like to encourage um, private um, family time. Um, so before the public comes in, sometimes I, we think it's good to have um, just time alone with your loved one, just as a family. Um, and then of course, a time for family and friends, public, although that, has been um, obviously, um, yeah, we, we have been doing less and less of that since the pandemic, but we've been doing more and more private family time. Um, we also think that um, a ceremony to celebrate the life. Um, we, we do a lot of life celebrating at our funeral home, probably, you know, more so than most, but we strongly feel that celebrating a life helps um, helps you heal better um, and and that's our job really at the end of the day is is that after that celebration of life if you don't if you leave our funeral home feeling like you're taking a step into a, a grieving process then we've kind of we've done a good job you don't want to leave feeling like something was missing um, and of course a place for final disposition um, a lot of people say they they forget this important thing. You know, you say, "What do you What are you going to do with What do you want to do?" Well, I want to be cremated, okay. And then what? Oh, I don't know. I mean, that's not. Although the state considers it a final disposition, we really don't. You need to make a plan. Passing down your cremated remains to your kids and grandkids and great grandkids is really not a plan. So there's, there's a final place for disposition wherever it may be. A lot of people, we have a lot of winter Texans that they move down here and they, they leave their, all their kids and their grandkids and everybody up North. And then they both die, you know, and what's going to happen with those cremated remains. Sometimes, Sometimes people come to us, you know, Cynthia's smiling because she sees this, right? Hey, what do I do? I found these in my house. And uh, so they just give them to us, you know, well, what are we supposed to do? So there is a treasure in mission, the veteran cemetery, and it's free. So a lot of people don't know about that. You know, if you are a veteran and you don't know what you want to do with your cremated remains. Well, it doesn't take anything. You they'll, they'll um, memorialize them for you. So, um, what a final disposition is important. Um, sorry, uh, gathering and reception at our funeral home. We, you know, again, uh, pre-pandemic, you know, this new normal, but we still do allow it uh, after uh, a funeral. A lot. Of, this is another step people don't think about, but guess what? Everybody's got to eat. And so that's a, a final kind of a final part of the day is you do need to plan on oh, where are you going to have a reception? Even now, even if it's just family, nobody quit eating during the pandemic. So you still got to find a place where you're going to eat uh, and have some sort of a reception. So, um, so when a death occurs, um, what decisions will your family face? Well, um, have you shared your, your feelings about what you want to happen if something happens tomorrow, you know, some, you know, your choices are important and you need to let your families, your, your family know. And um, so it, it's from the simple point of you, did you, you want to be buried or cremated? I mean, those are simple questions and, and a lot of people are, they don't want to talk about them, but it, it's, it is inevitable. You know, I hate to tell you, but 
So how are you going to pay for it? So uh, it is the longer you live, the the more you spend. And so, yeah, a lot of times it's a, a burden that's left to the kids. Um, you cannot. So all funeral homes are different, but you've got different different life insurances. Now, our funeral home will take and take an assignment on your life insurance. So if you have a, an in, a life insurance with, you know, New York life or whatever we'll take and, and take an assignment. So they'll pay us the funeral amount before they pay you, but you can't do that with all life insurances. A lot of teachers or government workers are under this um, misconception that, Oh, well, they'll just take my life insurance. Well, guess what? Those entities don't allow for someone to take an assignment on your life insurance. So now uh, hopefully you've got good friends, Mark and Carla that say, Oh yeah, well, we'll wait for three or six months, whenever you get your life insurance from, from a government entity, which isn't super quick, but if you don't have Mark and Carla or, you know, most people are going to say, no, you, we need a check. So how are you, how are you going to get paid? Um, so then, you know, we see it all the time. Oh, we're going to have a barbecue or fundraiser, you know, and it, it's just not a time to have to, to deal with all that, you know? Um, so here, here's obviously the differences. Immediate funerals can cause significant financial stress. Um, they're highly emotional. Um, they can they can lead to uneasiness due to emotional spending. You know, you have one part of the family that that thinks, you know, that that wants to do simple, 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 and one part that wants to have a giant party. So, um, and then they. Uh, and then you create uncertainty, you know, did we, did we do what mom wanted? I don't know. Do you think she would have wanted this? And so, um, whereas if you do a pre-need, obviously, uh, there's affordable terms, payment plans. Um, you're much more relaxed when you're making that choice. There's no pressure. Um, if you, if you prepay for it, you know that you have financial protection and then your family knows that you, you do, you chose. And I, and I have another, just, I have lots of examples that, um, a lady came in and, and prepaid for her funeral and she had cancer and her husband and her kids were mad. They didn't want her to do it. And the, matter of fact, they called her three or four times while she was sitting in there with me. Uh, about six months later, she passed away. And when her husband came into the funeral home, he just was just a mess. And when I, the look on his face, when he says, well, I got to go get a casket. I said, no, 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 no. She already took care of that. Just the relief. And then he says, well, where is she going to be buried? I got to go pick her burial space. I said, no, 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 no. She, she took care of that too. And he was just, you know, it was just amazing to see that, that level of stress come down. And he said, well, what about me? I want to be, I thought we would be together. I said, don't worry. She got you one too. So Everything was, you know, less stressed for, for him and his family. And, it, you know, it made them a lot, uh, it was a lot easier for them to celebrate her life, which was a beautiful life. So, um, so anyway, your journey, and if you want to pre-plan, you can make your own decisions. So. That's all I got. I'll answer questions. At the end. Awesome. Okay, perfect. So once again, I want to say thank you to our presenters for sharing this awesome information. And I think that as we um, hear it, I see more people coming onto the, the live session as well, um, asking for information on, you know, if this is going to be recorded or whatever, because we realize how important it is that we have these conversations now. And as hard as it might be, um, it's really, really important that we start thinking about this. And just like that story that you shared, Carla, you know, it's about you know, the burden that's going to be left on the family. And when you have a situation like that with the pre-planning, having the situation, you know, already discussed and organized, it just makes it so much easier on the family and fulfilling the wishes of, of, of the person that has passed. So I think that um, that was a great example to why we're having a meeting like this today. Huh. I want to chime in on something Carla said, you know, she was telling that story about the cancer patient that came in and her family's telling her, don't do it. I see that a lot in the Valley. I have so many people who say they're not going to they're not going to plan because then as soon as they plan they're going to die. That's the <laughs> that's the valley mentality. 
They're not going to plan. They're not going to sign a will because if they sign a will, they're going to die. They're not going to estate plan because if they do it, they're going to die. But what happens is they end up getting dementia. And then all of a sudden, their children are left with this burden with no power of attorney, no estate plan. And a lot of these Hispanic families have seven or ten kids. And they're leaving a small estate, one small house, to seven or ten kids. One of those kids dies. All of a sudden, it's eight or ten or twelve heirs on one small property that own it. And guess what happens? They can't come to an agreement. I see it happen on the funeral side where they where they fight. One person no. ends up paying for no. everything. And it's really sad to see that one 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 child is usually the one burdened with that. So as a parent. As, as a, you know, who loves your children, I, I strongly advise you make an estate plan. I strongly advise you pre-plan your funeral expenses. It's, it's all very helpful to allow your children and your heirs to grieve properly without the stress of everything. Yeah, so exactly. Okay, and with that, we're going to jump into a few questions. And so I'm just going to ask those uh, Adam, I'm going to start with you, Miss Cynthia, with some of the questions we we had on your presentation, um, and just kind of go through them. And again, those of you that are on the call on Zoom, if you have questions, please type those into the chat box, and we'll we'll make sure to ask those. A reminder to those who are on social media, whether it's Facebook or on our YouTube page, um, please just leave your comments in the comment section, and we'll we'll address those as we go. Um, so I'm going to start again with um, Cynthia Benavides. Can you, uh, once again, kind of clarify on the difference between, you mentioned that there is a difference between a will and an estate plan, um, or just a quick uh, update on what the, what the difference between that is. Well, a will is a written document that, that puts forth your last wishes, okay? An estate plan is not just the one document. An estate plan takes into consideration whether you need powers of attorney, which I would advise everybody needs powers of attorney. It also takes into consideration whether you really need a will. Because perhaps instead of a will, all you, and this is what I see a lot, is I see a lot of uh, small estates where we have just a house and a bank account, for instance. So let's say we have mom and pop, all they have is a house, that they've lived in for 75 or 80 years, and they have a bank account, maybe two bank accounts, and maybe they have some life insurance. Well, the bank account and the life insurance are going to pass as soon as they pass away if they have a name to pay on death beneficiary. I would not advise a will if they had only been married to each other, only had children of the marriage, and only had the house. What I would advise is something called a lady bird. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a transfer on death deed for, for married couples. And that deed gets recorded immediately. And what that deed says is this house is ours as long as we live. During our lifetime, we can sell it, we can mortgage it, we can rent it. Uh, we can do what we want as long as we live. But as soon as we die, this house goes to heir number one and two. And so instead of a will, which does not get recorded by the way, a lot of people believe a will gets recorded. It does not get reported. Okay. A will gets filed in court post-death. It does not get reported during your lifetime. But this transfer on death deed does get reported as soon as you execute it. We take it. We record it in the real property records. And as soon as you die, that property is going to automatically pass to your heirs without going to court. So is it a better option to pay me $500 for a will and then pay me two to $3,000 to take your will to court? Total expense, you're looking at twenty five hundred minimum. If it's a, you know, and then if I did the lady bird deed or a transfer on death deed, you're paying me five hundred on the front end and nothing on the back end. What's the better deal for you? Well, you need an estate planning attorney who's honest, who's going to tell you this is a better option for you. Now, if I were a dishonest attorney, I'd say I'd try to sell the will to everybody because then guess what? They've got to come back to me for the probate. Or go back to another attorney for the probate. And I can make money on the front end and the back end. But I'm not that kind of attorney. I'm an honest attorney. I'm gonna sit down with you. I'm gonna explain to you, I'm gonna go through all of your assets. What do you own? Do you have a car? Do you have a home? Do you have a bank account? Do you have a life insurance policy? And then I'm gonna create a plan specific for you that is cost efficient now and in the future. 
and you get to make that decision. But, you know, it's specific to each person. I would not necessarily advise uh, these transfer on death or Lady Bird deeds for a young couple if they're still starting out and they're they're thinking about investing, they're going to grow their assets, then perhaps somebody like that, they have young children, somebody who's younger, I would not advise a transfer on death or Lady these are specific plans that require an attorney's consultation, whether it's me or someone else. All right. Awesome. Okay. And Cynthia, we have another one that just came in live from Sharon. And she's asking, shouldn't you still have a will in case your estate has claims against others? Say in the case where the cause of death is an accident and a suit needs to be pursued. Okay. Well, those are, that's a very specific question. Okay. Yeah. And so, that's going to require a consultation where I require more information from her and sit down with her and say, and, and even without a will. So let's say all I had was my house and my bank account. But right before death, the way I died was in a car. Well, there's still an alternative, even if I died without a will, there's still an alternative to go through what we call a determination of heirship proceedings. And so we can still determine who the heirs are through this proceeding. Um, and if it's necessary at that point in time, then you would have to go through a determination of airship proceeding, which costs a little bit more than a probate, but not that much more. And that's not something that, that can be foreseen. Now, there are some clients who want to try to plan for the unpredictable. You know, what if I die in the car accident? What if my, what if my heirs have claims, uh, you know, and, and I only want this one child to get it, not the other two? Well, if that's the case, then that's something that would be brought up in consultation. Um, and we would we would possibly do what we call the transfer on death deed or the lady bird deed and the will. And I do do that for some clients where we do both um, because they want to make sure that that asset goes as quickly as possible without having to delay. So, so post-death, there's no delay in receiving the asset. They don't have to wait for a court proceeding. It's theirs immediately. They want to sell it immediately, they can't. And that's why pay on debt, transfer on debt, these and lady bird deeds are so powerful in the state of Texas. Um, but a will, you're going to have to wait two to three months post debt, sometimes more, because a lot of times they don't come to me till three to six months post debt, you know, because they want time to grieve. They don't have, if somebody doesn't die and they don't come to me immediately. They're coming to me three to six months after the fact, after they've had time to grieve and are ready to deal with the issues of taking a will to court. Got it. Um, another question we have for you, um, Cynthia, is once we make these arrangements and these plans, who should keep them? Uh, who should be in charge of these, these documents? Um, who do we leave them with? Great question. So as I said earlier, the will does not get recorded. Okay, We do not record wills in the real property records. So Those get filed with the court post-death if you have to go through a probate procedure. Um, what I advise my clients, we give them the originals. We do not keep originals here. We uh, we give them the originals after they execute them in our office. We retain, we always retain uh, digital copies for our clients in case they lose their will, okay? Or in case they lose their paperwork or in case it gets damaged and it's not legible. We, I usually advise, uh, and it's really up to each client who they want to give copies to. We usually give them two copies of all their documents um, with their original and we advise them to give it to who they feel like giving it to. Maybe they want to give a copy to their children who are going to be their beneficiaries. Maybe they want to give a copy to the agent who, are, who they've named in the power of attorney. Um, maybe they don't want to give anybody copies because it's their personal private decision, and that's acceptable as well. But what I do advise is if they don't give copies to the named beneficiaries or to the agents, that they at least put it in a safe place where in their home, preferably a fire safe container, um, a blood safe container, uh, and that they advise their, their future, whoever they've named as their independent administrator or whoever they've named as their agent on the powers of attorney, I advise them to at least tell them where they keep these important documents so that if something happens, they'll know where to find them. Okay, but they don't have to get them copied if they're not comfortable. Got it. And then another one that just came in online from Laura is, it sounds like an estate plan will make things a lot easier for the surviving family members instead of just a will. Is that what you're advising? 
Well, I mean, a will could be part of the estate plan. I want to clarify. A will can be part of your particular estate plan. It's just that each estate plan is special. It can be a will, or it can be a ladybird, or it can be a transbondecti, or it can be none of those and just powers of attorney. Each person's estate plan is different. So, yes, an estate plan can certainly make errors or or, you know, the caretaker, whoever the, the child that's typically the caretaker can make their life a lot easier, especially if they have powers of attorney. A lot of what I see is um, a child, a grown child coming into me and they're the caretaker for their parent with dementia. And that parent no longer has capacity to make decisions for themselves. And they come and they say, I need to talk to their Medicaid provider. And they're not talking to me anymore because mom is not able to get on the phone and tell them to talk to you. And so in that case, if they don't have a power of attorney or a medical power of attorney, well, usually for talking to somebody on the phone, on behalf of somebody else with a general power of attorney, which is important. Um, and if they don't have the capacity to find that anymore, then I have to advise a guardianship. And that is, you know, a more complex process and more costly. Whereas the power of attorney, having you done it prior to the dementia, could have saved them thousands. Awesome. Thank you, Cynthia. And if, if more questions come in, I will let you know. I'm going to jump over to uh, Carla and Mark over here in regards to Michaela Funeral Services. Um, some of the questions here is any additional services that you all can share um, that you all offer to families during this process? And then on top of that, I also wanted to ask, I know that you also offer um, services for pets. So I kind of wanted to see if you can touch on that as well. Um, additional services, um, in, in addition to um, pre-planning services, is, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand that, that question, Barbara. Well, I may be, it may be they're asking about uh, shipping loved ones back home via uh, airplane or um, shipping overseas. We have one lady we're, we're working on to ship back to the Philippines that this takes time um, because we got to get paperwork from the Philippine, Philippine consulate. But um, we do any and all disposition that you could think of. Barrel at sea, uh, shipping back to Mexico, um, anything you can think of, we, we, we can do. And and, um, and we also do own a cemetery, so um, we do um, so some A to Z. So if you say, well, we, but a lot of people, it's interesting um, how people pre-plan. But you come in and they say, yeah, mom's got everything done. Well, when mom says she has everything done, sometimes she only has the cemetery part, or sometimes she only has the funeral part, and they think that that's everything. Or um, we see that people go, oh, dad's a veteran. They think that dad's whole funeral is going to be paid for. By the VA, and that doesn't work. Only if you die in action. So only the burial site is. So um, we do um, from the funeral side to the burial side. And yes, we do also take care of pets. Um, we do pet cremation. And so, you know, depending on the size of your pet, our pricing for that is also all of our pricing, by the way, um, and we it has been all, always uh, is on our website. So, you know, we're very transparent. You can log on our website and look at every package we've got, look at every urn we've got, every um, casket we have and uh, pets as well. Pets, we will we do um, we do offer private cremation um, and we will pick up if, if needed for an additional fee. Um, most of the time, people will bring their, their pet to us. Got it. And uh, you mentioned the cost. It's on your website. We'll put your web um, website up on the screen and in the comment section as well of the presentation here today. But can you give us an estimate on one of the questions here, starting costs of what to plan for for somebody who's starting that process? Um, we have, we have a, a, like a simple graveside service that starts at $44.99 and then we go up from there. Um, our life, what, my, yeah, you have to select your casket on top of that, but then we have our um, life celebration package 
that is uh, $52.99 plus the casket. So it just um, goes from there. And then we have our simple cremation options. And we also will do a live celebration with cremation. Um, you do not, you know, there's times I have somebody right now that they lost a ton of weight and they don't want to have a public viewing and that's fine. But you know what? We're going to have a big life celebration with their picture. You'd be amazed what we can do on a memorial. Uh, we can still celebrate a life and we can, and we can make it all about that person. We, we do. I tell people when they, when they do a life celebration with us and if you've been in our funeral home that, there's, there's never two services that are the same. You know, everybody's life is, is unique. So we do definitely, um, it takes a, a little bit of effort and some help from the family. Uh, but that's what we like to focus on. I have a question for you, Carla, or, or Mark. Um, so what if, what if we purchase a package with you and then 15 years from now we up and move and decide, you know what, we'd rather get buried in this new site. Um, what happens to what we've invested in our package at that point? That's a good question. Um, so we cannot hang on to your money for more than 30 days. So if you come to me and you say, you know what, mom is in hospice, and I want to go ahead and, and pay for our funeral, you can do that. Uh, but at day 30, I'm going to say, hey, mom's still in hospice. We have to move that money into a trust. So either a trust or a third-party trust, something of that sort. Um, and that is a, a lot of times people don't realize, and we do get people to transfer that come to a funeral home all the time, that they bought their funeral with another establishment. They've changed their mind. but Or like you said, so the day they move. Um, happens all the time. So... Basically, it's, a, it's almost like a pay on death, really and truly, but except for it's a guaranteed plan. Now, if you come to McCaleb and you bought a $7,000 funeral and you move to, you know, Austin and you say, okay, well, I want to go to such and such funeral home. And he can, that funeral home can say, I'll take that plan with the guarantee or I'll just take the money and you pay me the difference. So he does not have to guarantee that plan like McCaleb does. So at that point, it's up to the funeral home. But the money and, and any growth on that money is still yours. And you can take it anywhere you want. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, I just want to mention here, um, Lillian Cisneros put a comment on here saying, thank you to Carla and Mark. Uh, you made the process so much easier for us when we lost both of our parents um, and now planning for ourselves. So I thought that'd be nice to share that, you know, they a compliment and then a, from experience. Um, another, another question we have here for you, uh, for you, Carla and Mark is when, when do you start this process? When do you have the conversation um, with yourself and maybe with your family about when to start the advanced planning process and, and, and considering to, to pre-plan your, your funeral expenses? I personally think you should start now. I'm probably about our age, <laughs> but about all of, you know, mine and well, Mark's age, but... You just don't know what the next step holds. I mean, you know, it, we take a chance on everything we do. We get up in the morning and we put the key in the ignition. That's the chance we're taking. Uh, walking down the street, you know, if everything we do, we're taking a chance. So if you can get it, start now, get it done. I have friends of mine that are my age. They pre plan 18 years ago, they were 38 years old. And they're done. I mean, they're they're good to go. But you just don't know. We've had people from uh, uh, retirement homes that have come in at 92 years old and say, I, I need to get this done. Uh, because when my dad died, when he was 60, I didn't want to go through it. I was 30. And da, 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 da. Well, he still hadn't come back. Well, and you don't, and your, and your wishes are the only thing that can't be disputed. Only your wishes. And we have had, seen it so often, the craziest stuff. People have this misconception. First of all, they think that whoever pays is in charge. No, not the case. Next of kin is next of kin. The other thing, too, Cynthia does a great job talking about power of attorney, but they think, oh, 
well, I'm still in charge because I'm I have power of attorney. Well, now that's that's over. Uh, and I don't know how many times, but it's happened way more than I would like it to happen. That crazy enough, people don't hire an attorney like Cynthia and they just get estranged from their spouse, their first spouse. And then they go on and live with somebody for another 20 or 30 years, maybe even have kids with them. Who knows? But guess what? Who's in charge of that funeral if they want to be? Their wife that's estranged for 30 years because they never got divorced. The next again, that's who's planning your final celebration. That's and that happens, you know. And I think that's a good point, Carla. I mean, a lot of people don't understand that in the state of Texas, there is no such thing as a legal separation. You have to get divorced. You know, and a lot of people in the Valley, I, maybe it's due to religion, but they choose to separate, become estranged, live completely separate lives with another person, but they never got divorced. And that has estate planning implications and it has funeral planning implications yes. as well. It, and that's why in my, in my slideshow, I said, you know, something I can help you consider is, are you separated versus are you divorced? Because a lot of people don't understand that they're they're still tied to that person legally, and and that person has inheritance rights as well as, uh, you know, uh, as you said, kin, you know, next to kin rights. Yeah. Awesome. And I have a few more questions before we close up. Um, one of them that just came in live for you, Miss Cynthia, says. Um, they were a little late to the presentation, but did you address having right of survivorship for bank and investment accounts? I did. I did address that. That was the pay on death beneficiary section of my slides where we talked about non-probate assets versus probate assets. So a non-probate asset would be bank accounts that have right of survivorship. And that's another way that we can avoid the probate process. Um, again, that's something that's individualized. I sit with you. We go through your asset list. I answer any questions you have, and I kind of help you jog your memory. I strongly advise that, you know, if you're a type A person, you make yourself some lists of all your assets. Um, I personally love Excel and love to make my list in there. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that is something I address is that if you have a pay on death account, such as a bank account, all your heir has to do is walk in with the death certificate. And if they are the heir, the bank will talk to them and will give them the, you know, write a check to them as it is hand up and sure that counts. Got it. And uh, Carla and Mark, as far as um, the pre-planning for your payroll expenses, can, can somebody go in and create a plan with you and start making payments on that? Is that a payment that has to be made up front where they can start making payments with you once they create a plan? They can start making payments and they can, we have insured plans and we have um, dollar for dollar plans. So um, depending on the costs and, and, and they can make that decision. If you're, if you're someone like our age, um, it makes sense to get an insured plan basically and just because it's very affordable. So while you're paying on that funeral arrangement, if something happens to you, um, the funeral will be paid um, through insurance. Uh, or you can get what we call like a dollar for dollar plan where you take that exact, whatever the funeral cost is and just divide it over three years or, you know, five years if you want and, and just keep paying on it. Once it's paid off, then it's, you know, the, it's frozen. So. Is that the typical payment period, Carla, like three to five year plans max? Just that yeah. Three. I mean, you have people that will go as far as, you know, we, so, so any, any, Insurance agent can can sell a policy really, um, and and name our funeral home as a, as long as we approve it, and you'll see them do seven, mm. ten years even. But I don't like it um, personally because the the odds of that policy lapsing during that time. You know, if you got a seven year policy, you change your checking account, you um, like you said, maybe get some dementia something. If you miss a payment and that policy lapses, then you no longer have the guaranteed cost mm -hmm. of the funeral. So then you say, okay, well, dad put in 5,000, we have to come up with the difference instead of having that actual guarantee. So we really do try to, to 
hopefully get you paid off in three to five years. Um, we think that's best. Awesome. And I want to mention that I know um, Michaela Funeral Home has uh, changed their services a little bit with the whole pandemic situation. You all have done a lot of great things. I know even streaming services. Um, live for family to be able to view with those who can't be there, you know, at the, at the funeral. So I think that's really neat. So giving families different options of, of ways to, to make it happen and, and be able to, like you say, celebrate their life and, um, and, and be there with the family. So awesome. With that, I want to close up. I want to say thank you so much to those who have joined us online. I think we had a lot of great questions that came in and a lot of people who've joined who, who have liked today's uh, workshop. We appreciate you all taking time to come and, and speak to us before I close. Do you, any of you want to say anything, Cynthia, Carla and Mark, anything you all want to share before we close up? I just want to mention that we do take precautions during the pandemic. We have a lot of dividers, glass dividers in our main conference room. Um, or we keep everybody safe and healthy, as safe and healthy as we can. We sanitize between and we also allow a lot of electronic communication, whether it's email, phone, on consultations and payments online as well to try to avoid as much uh, in-person contact as we can. Awesome, yeah, and Cynthia, and those who didn't get to catch um, the ribbon cutting that we got to do with uh, Cynthia's law firm, you should check it out. She does a really excellent tour of her facility and even the conference room that you have with the big screen where they could come you know, do the, a virtual consultation and things like that. So if you didn't get to check that out, I encourage you to, to do so because it, um, really shows her, her beautiful space there. And again, thank you, Cynthia, for, for being with us today. Uh, Carla, Mark, anything y'all want to share before we close up? Um, yeah, the same thing. You know, we, we like you said, we do our, are doing uh, YouTube. Um, we try to live stream almost every service. Um, we've done um, where we have a, the radio station in the, they can tune in on AM in the parking lot even. But I'll say one thing that we stopped doing for a while in person because pandemic you know but people are really really hurting so we started it back up again we feel that we do it safe we social distance we keep the area spotless but we started our grief group back about four weeks ago and you know we haven't had a huge attendance but there's some things that there's some things that need to be in person and i'm telling you that if you know somebody that's struggling i mean if you know somebody that's lost someone we are continuing our in-person grief group thursday evening six to eight and you know i know people are sometimes afraid to come but uh, we do keep it safe and and it's the, the emotional effect of being alone i think is really something that we need to to um think about and so we are here if anybody would like to join us on Thursdays. Awesome. Well, wonderful. Once again, thank you so much to our presenters today. We have um, Michaela Funeral Home and Cynthia Benavides Law Firm. We thank you all so much for your time. We thank you for being members of the chamber and, and sharing your expertise with the community. We, we very much appreciate that. And for those of you who are watching live, thank you for joining us. This session also has been recorded and will be on our YouTube page for anybody who wants to go back and reference that or hear any of the questions or information that was shared. Uh, we wish everybody a wonderful day. Thank you once again to our speakers and we hope everybody has a great day. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thanks. Mm -hmm. Small businesses are the heart of our community. We are absolutely crucial. We bring flair to our community. We are essential. We are vital. Strong local businesses mean a strong community to live, work, and play in. From our family to yours, one transaction at a time. Strong local businesses mean generations of families working together. It only takes one purchase. One purchase. It only takes one meal. It takes one pound of brisket. All it takes is one round of golf. We need your support now more than ever. So stop by and support local. You'll never regret supporting small. Support small businesses. Support small.
support West Lego today for a stronger West Lego tomorrow. Together we are West Lego strong.